Okay, let me wait a minute before we begin. Do we have any questions from the last week? Any questions? I guess not. All right, let's start. So, uh, uh, the topics for the day, we're gonna begin our series of lectures on how to learn a neural network. Today, we'll look at uh, the basic problem of learning, the perceptron rule for learning individual perceptrons and why you couldn't use it to train multi-layer perceptrons. Basically, a little bit of history here. Uh, the slides contain uh, information on two algorithms called Adeline and Madeline. Uh, we expect you to go over the slides because they, they will feature in the quiz. And we're going to introduce the notion of learning through empirical risk minimization. At any point, you can always interrupt me and ask questions, right? So here's where we were. We saw that neural networks are universal Boolean or universal function approximators. They can model any Boolean function, they can model any classification boundary, and they can model any continuous valued function, provided the network satisfies some minimal architecture constraints. So we saw uh, in the last class that uh, for any function, there's a minimum depth below which the network size must increase exponentially for it in order to model uh, the target function. And uh, in the worst case, and if you don't provide the network with as many neurons as is required to model the function, it can never model the function. Now, even so, in general, we also saw that uh, with appropriate activations, having a deeper network is generally a lot more effective than having a uh, shallow network. All that said, so we have some general principles for, for how the networks may be built. But then when we go back and look at our AI problems, like speech recognition or image captioning or uh, predicting the next game state. Now these can all be modeled. These are basically functions. Something goes in, something comes out. And in between there's a neural network. And the neural because these are functions, the neural network can model the function. But then for it to do that, we have to answer several questions. Now, for example, consider something like a game state. In goes a game state, out comes a game state, right? Or a predict or a recommendation for a game state. But these are mathematical functions. They can only deal with numbers and vectors, mathematical ob objects. So what goes in and what comes out? How does a game state become a number? How does a predicted game state become a number? So we have to figure out we have to specify how to represent the input and how to represent the output in a manner that can be operated on by a function, by a mathematical function. That's the first aspect. The second aspect is uh, what's in the function itself? How do you compose the network that performs this function? Now we'll look at uh, how to represent inputs and outputs a bit later in the next lecture. Today's lecture is going to look at how do you compose the function that performs the desired, the network that performs the desired function? So, again, going back, we are speaking of multi-layer perceptrons. The units in the network are individual perceptrons, which I may also call neurons at various times. And here was the general structure of the perceptron. It first computed an affine function of the inputs, which is a weighted sum of all inputs plus a bias. So the first computation resulted in an affine value Z. Get familiar with this term Z because we're gonna keep seeing it all in all the lectures henceforth. And then this affine term Z is put through an activation function of some kind to obtain the network output Y. And in the basic perceptron that we saw, the activation function was a threshold function. But we also saw that we can have uh, uh, 
other kinds of activations, you know, once, once we recast it in this manner, like the sigmoid or this rectification function or a smooth, smooth inversion or anything else. Now, this network can be redrawn slightly differently. Instead of saying that I have a bias, a weighted sum of inputs plus a bias, I can also say that my input itself is extend by an, extended by an additional component whose value is always one. And then the weight of this additional component will end up being my bias. Uh, did this redrawing make sense to you guys? Did the matter? Okay, so, all right. So assuming that this makes sense, let me continue. So here's the structure of the network. We're going to assume a feed-forward network. What I mean by a feed-forward network is that there are no loops. So you have some input. The inputs are processed by some one layer of neurons. Their outputs go to the next layer of neurons, and their outputs go to the next layer of neurons, and so on. So the information always flows in one direction. It never loops back and comes back to an, a, a neuron. So once a neuron has processed a particular input, it's never going to see that input again in any manner. Now, part of the design of the network is the architecture of the network. How many layers will the network have? How many neurons are going to be in each layer and so on? For now, I'm going to assume that the architecture of the network is capable of representing the desired function. Again, we saw in the last class that if the network is got, is, uh, has uh, fewer neurons than are essential to model the function, then it can never model the function. We are going to assume in today's lecture that the architecture provided to us is okay. It can model the function. So now, when we speak, describe it in this manner, what are the parameters of the network? The parameters of the network are the parameters of the individual neurons themselves. So there'd be the weights and the biases of all of the neurons. And if I just add this extra component input that's always one, then I can represent the bias also by, as a weight term. So I can represent the complete set of parameters of the function as the set of weights of all of the neurons which I've represented using this block W. And then once stated this way, the entire network is just a function which operates on the input X and has parameters W and based on the input X and the set parameter settings is going to produce an output Y. Now observe this notation. I said I've represented, as F, I've represented it as F of X semicolon W. The semicolon W means that the term W represents parameters. Anything that comes after the semicolon represents the parameters of the network. And anything that comes before the semicolon are the arguments to the function. So anything after the semicolon are the parameters of the function and anything before are the arguments. And now uh, learning these, these parameters must be set to appropriate values to get the desired behavior from the network. If you want the model, the network to compute a specific function, then these, dub, these W values must be set appropriately to compute that function. So moving on. Uh, are the general basics clear, the way we've set it up? Yes? Give me a yes or no. All right, okay, thank you. All right, let me continue. So now, what we've seen in previous classes is that the MLP can compute, represent, um, can compute any function, meaning give me a function and I can construct an MLP that can compute it. So. MLPs can be constructed to represent pretty much any function. But then how do we construct this MLP to compute a specific function? You can construct it by hand. For example, if I want an MLP that gives me this decision boundary with a one inside the diamond and zero outside, we know exactly how to do it. We know the equations for all the boundaries. So we can compute one percent, add one percent on each for each of the boundaries and then all them up. And so, you know, you can literally handcraft your network for some trivial problems like these. But the problem is that in all but the simplest functions, for all but the simplest functions, it's not 
possible to handcraft the network. We have to figure out some automated way of learning the network. So more generally, if you are given a function g of x of some kind, and we want to build a network that can model it, we have to derive the parameters of the network w such that this network computes this function. How would we do it? Now, you are given some target function that you would want to want the network to model. So here I've got a 2D version of the function, but for illustration, I'm going to give you a, show you a function of just one argument. So here, this dotted blue line is the function g of x that you want the network to compute. Now, for any given setting of w, the network is going to compute some function, not necessarily the function that you want. And so uh, this dotted red line shows you the function that the network computes for any given setting of w. So if I give you a current setting of w, it's going to compute a function shown by the dotted red line, it would not necessarily be the function that you want to compute, which is the dotted blue line. And so between the function that the network actually computes and the function that you want the network to compute, there is an error. So this one here, this bar here, shows the error between the actual output of the network and the desired output of the network at this value of x. The shaded area shown here between the actual function and the target function, that is the total error. That's the complete error that the network makes over all possible inputs. It's the integral of this error function taken over the entire input space. And what we want to do is to compute the network parameters w such that the shaded area is minimized. Basically compute, estimate the w shown as w hat, which minimizes the total error, where the total error is the integral of this error function, which quantifies the gap between the actual and desired outputs over the entire input space. Any questions? What's the scale? Okay, that's only, okay. So, the problem here is that more often than not, the function that we are trying to model g of x is not known. That's ans answering you accurately, right? What we are speaking of is that, so let's say I have some arbitrary function g of x. For instance, I'm trying to find sine of x. I want to compute a, compute a neural network that compute sine of x. It's easy. I can compute this error between what the network actually computes at each x and sine of x. Take the integral, find the w that minimizes it. More generally, you don't know what the function is, right? No one is going to specify the function that the uh, network is going to, is supposed to model. Because if you had the function, why do you need the network? Whatever function you had, you could just compute it. So, what you will have instead are samples. You're going to have samples of the function at various inputs. So if this g of x is shown by this mesh, all you're going to observe is what is the value of g of x at certain inputs shown by these red dots. And uh, from these dots alone, we have to, we have to determine the network parameters that compute the, X, the uh, complete function. Now, what are these input-output pairs? Remember, the functions that we are trying to learn are they doing performing tasks like speech recognition, image captioning, whatever, what have you, right? And so the input-output relationships are just training data. You want to say, here is an image. I want the output of the network to be cat. Or here is the value x. I want the net output of the network to be f of x. And so you can compute, just gather these, when you gather these training data, all you're doing is obtaining samples of the input and the corresponding value of the function. And now we want to learn the entire function just from these examples. You want to learn this entire mesh 
just from these examples, from these training samples. So that, on any questions so far? Questions? So, Rachiti, let's get to your question, right? We don't actually have the total error because we don't know g of x. Instead, what we will have is a certain number of samples where we know the target value. And at these samples, we will also know the actual output of the network itself. And so we will compute the empirical error, which is the average of these errors over all of the training samples. And this average error is what is going to be our proxy for this total error. And this is the best we can do. And so we're going to try to estimate the network parameters to minimize this average error. And that is how we're going to train the network. We want to find the network parameters that fit the training points exactly, which is to say the network parameters that minimize the empirical error, which is the average error over all of the training samples. And our hope is that if you train the network, if you learn the network to predict the function exactly at these training points, it will somehow also figure out. Uh, it will all somehow also be computing the correct function in these other inputs which have not been given in, as part of the training. <coughs> that makes sense? <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So here's a story. <coughs> I'm extremely sorry. Cough isn't going away. So here's the story so far. Learning a network is the problem of determining the parameters of the network required for it to model a desired function. The network must have sufficient capacity to model it. Ideally, we would like to optimize the network to represent the desired function everywhere, but this requires knowledge of the function everywhere. Instead, we draw input-output training instances from the function and estimate the network parameters to fit the input-output relationship at just these instances and hope that the function fits everywhere else as well. That's basically what we're doing. And so here we have our first poll. Where can I? Uh, can you see the poll? Okay, 10 seconds, guys. All right, let me stop this call. So, uh, does anybody want to guess? Tell me the answer to the first question. If neural networks, since neural networks are universal approximators, any network of any architecture, architecture can approximate any function. Is this true? False, right? You need to have the appropriate architecture, otherwise the network can never model the function. Now, what about the statements below? The network architecture must have sufficient capacity to model the function, true or false? Right, otherwise it cannot. The network is actually a parametric function whose parameters are its weights and biases, true or false? True, right? The parameters must be learned to best approximate the target function, true or false? Also true. The parameters can be perfectly learned from just a few training samples, even if the actual target function is known, true or false, false, right? You have no way of knowing how what it learns at the wrong points. Lovely, you guys have nailed everything. Right, so 
Now let's begin with a very simple task. I'm trying to learn a classifier. Classifiers are simpler than regressions. And the reason we're starting with classifiers is that classifiers were amongst the earliest problems addressed using MLPs. Specifically, we're going to consider binary classification. This will also generalize to multi-class classification, but for discussion, we'll use the binary classification problem. Now, when I'm, when I'm performing binary classification, here is the kind of situation we're going to find ourselves in. A binary classifier, let's assume I have just a single uh, one-dimensional input, just for visualization. Then you're going to have just a, a set of Xs, right? Uh, a single uh, input component X. And the target classifier is going to output zero for, for some Xs and one for the other Xs. So let's just assume that the target function we want to model is shown by this green line. Anything to the left of this threshold should be classified as class zero. Anything to the right should be classified as class one. Now, when I pick up some, that's the target function, but we don't know it, right? Now, when I pick up some training samples, maybe I get these five training samples, X1 through X5. So what we would do is uh, uh, actually the blue line is, okay. Uh, we would specify for each X, the actual output value that we want. So we, we say that for this X, I want the actual output to be zero. For this, I want this to be zero. For these three, I want the actual output to be one. And then our current function, now shown uh, you know, with inverted uh, notation by this dotted line, is given by this dotted line. So the current set of Ws gives you this dotted line. The current function is classifying the inputs correctly at three points it's making two errors, right? So the obvious, how do I quantify how wrong the network is? When I look at this network, it's very easy. When I look at this plot, it's very easy for me to say that the network is making two mistakes, two errors here and here. And so the empirical error is going to be what fraction of inputs it's making errors on, and it's going to be 0.4. You're going to count the number of times that the output of the function is not equal to the desired function and divide by the total number of samples. So this is your empirical error. And when you're training the network, you're going to try to estimate the W to minimize this error. Now, once I specify the Xs, the only thing you can modify is the W. So given the Xs, the empirical error is just a function of W. And so, your training is going to try to find the W that minimizes this empirical error. We're trying, basically trying to minimize the count of misclassifications. Is that clear to everybody? Right, okay. So how do we do it? Now the original MLP, as we know, is a network of threshold units. When we go back to Rosenblatt, and so I'm going back into history. And we know that even Rosenblatt's network with threshold activations can model any classification boundary, right? So given this, how do you train this network to capture a given classification boundary, given only training instances of input-output pairs? Now, uh, instead of looking at the entire MLP, I'm going to try to think of the simplest possible MLP, which doesn't have multi-layers. It just, it's just a single perceptron. So a single perceptron is a uh, single unit of this kind. It computes an affine function of inputs and puts it through a threshold activation. Again, we're going back to the original perceptron. This perceptron captures a function of this kind. There's a hyperplane boundary. The hyperplane boundary is given by where z is exactly equal to zero. And on one side of the boundary, it outputs a one. On the other side, it outputs a zero. So if for two dimensional inputs, if I plotted it, it's going to look like this heavy side function. But then in our training scenario, you wouldn't be given the function. You're only going to be given some inputs and, R, and their corresponding outputs. You'd only be given these red and blue dots and the uh, information that on the red dots, you want the output to be one. On the blue dots, you want the output to be zero. And so from just these dots, 
we want to learn the weights and the bias of the perceptron so that it classifies these dots perfectly. So again, here is the equation of the perceptron. It computes this affine function of inputs, summation wixi plus b. And if this affine value z is non-negative, the output is one, otherwise it's zero. And so we want to learn these weights and this bias given all of these input-output pairs such that the resulting perceptron function, which is actually a heavy side function, outputs a one on all of these red dots and a zero on all of these blue dots. So, uh, this clear so far? Folks? Okay. So, I'm going to restate it a little bit just for uh, convenience. Having this bias as an extra term is a bit of a nuisance, right? And the bias makes it affine. I'm going to convert the bar, this thing to a linear function by adding an extra input, which is one, and make it making its corresponding weight, the bias. And then I can just say that the perceptron outputs a, a, a one if the weighted sum of inputs is non-negative and zero otherwise. Now, how, how does this magic of uh, converting a, uh, uh, a, a linear function to uh, an affine function to a linear function happen. What exactly happened? We know that in an affine function, the uh, locus doesn't necessarily go through origin. We know that in a linear function, the locus goes through origin, right? How did adding a bias convert this to this? Does anybody um, does anybody have a feel for that? Anyone? So here is what happens. This is in two dimensions, right? When you add a bias, you add a third dimension. And the bias value is always set to one, right? So when you actually set this third value to one, now instead of just having X and Y, I have X, Y, and Z, okay? But the Z is always one. And so now you're working on this plane which, sorry, this plane, which is z is 1, right? Where z is always 1. And then on this plane, you have your points. And on this plane, your boundary is affine. Okay, it's somewhere out here. But then in, the, in this two-dimensional plane, but once you include the z, you can think of this affine, this line here as where a plane that goes through origin this goes to origin, intersects this plane, which is at one. And so although on this two-dimensional plane, your intersection is not on the origin, once you add the bias, you're basically shifting the whole plane up by one. Now I can actually draw a, a two-dimensional plane as opposed to a line, a two-dimensional plane in 3D, which intersects this first plane and also goes through origin. I'm not sure if that came across clearly, but uh, the uh, idea here is that, did, I, did that even make sense to you guys? Why is it 3D? <laughs> Again, uh, let me uh, go back here. So in, in 2D, you had this problem, right? You had these points and these points, and this was your decision boundary, right Prachi? Don't you think that makes sense? Yeah, okay. Now, let me, so this is a 2D plane. I can draw this like this, correct? I have all of these points and I have all of these points and there's a boundary here, right? And the axes are these two. So this boundary doesn't necessarily go through the origin, right? You with me? Let me raise this plane such that I add a third dimension, right? And now these are my two axes. This axis is the same as this guy, right? This one is the same as this one. I've add a, added a Z dimension. So I've taken this original two dimensional plane, put it in 3D and raised it to where Z equals one. That makes sense? That's what I did by fixing this 
additional component which is always equal to one. Does that make sense, Prachiti? What does indicate? I have, so here I had two dimensions. I've just added a third dimension, which was always one, right? I fixed an extra component, Prachiti. Did that make sense? So earlier I just had x1, x2, right? Now I converted it to x1, x2, then I added a third component, which is one. So that becomes 3D, right? What happens here? Alice, if I add an extra component, which is one, how many components does it have now? Two or three, right? So does everybody get that, right? Now, if I take all of my training points, where are they going to lie? The Z component is always one. So they're always going to lie on this plane where Z is one. Is that true or not? Alice, Prachiti, do you guys get that? Yeah, right? And so in this plane, the boundary didn't actually go through this, the, through the zero, zero point, right? Make sense? So on this plane, the boundary is still not going through origin. But then now I can draw a plane like so, where this line is part of this plane and that plane goes through origin in 3D. Does that make sense? Right? And that's how by adding a, an extra component, you converted something that was affine to linear. That makes sense to everybody. Want the Z value? So, Lakshya, what is the question? Want, want the Z value change when we create? No, the Z value is set to one, right? We have fixed the Z value to one. This is what we did. This additional component is always one. That's what we did, right? Lakshya, that answer your question? Yeah, right. So, by always having a Z value of one, you're always keeping it on this wherever I do this plane, right? Which is exactly at height one. And then although the line itself is not going through, you know, the origin on that plane, it can be thought of as where a two-dimensional plane intersects this guy. And that goes through the origin, okay? Anyway, getting back to our point. So now basically what I converted this to, did is to convert my problem to a linear problem. I want to find a hyperplane that goes through origin that perfectly separates the two group of points. Everybody with me so far? Okay. And so, and Alice and Prachiti, you guys had uh, some, you, you had some trouble with the plane. So did you get this? Alice, still having doubts? Okay, we'll take that offline, right? So now, so basically I want to find the hyperplane, summation wi xi equals zero, that perfectly separates the two group of groups of points. But then I can take all of these w's and put them into a vector. I can put and any, all of these, uh, all of, each x has multiple components, right? So I can put all of the components of x into a vector. So, so these xi's are not the training points. The xi's are the components of the vector x. So that's the equation of this line, right? And so the equation of this hyperplane is basically w transpose x equals zero. So I want to find the hyperplane defined by w transpose x equals zero that perfectly separates the red and blue dots. Now here, uh, I want to uh, maybe introduce another figure. So if I give you this, remember, if I have some space, I have, I have, some, I have some vector W, right? 
if I tell if I give you the equation w transpose x equals zero, what does it tell you about x? What does it tell you about x? It's orthogonal to doublet, right? Which means this is the equation for all x's that are orthogonal to w. This is the equation for this hyperplane, right? Consisting of all x's which are orthogonal to w. That makes sense? Okay. Now, if I have some point on this side of the line, on, on this side of the plane, which is the same direction as w, what is this angle going to be? How much is that angle? Is it greater than 90 or less than 90? Less than 90. So what can you tell me about W transpose X? This is going to be positive or negative. It's always going to be positive because W transpose X is proportional to the cosine, right? And then suppose I have a point on this side of the plane, away from it then what is this angle? Is it greater than 90 or less than 90? So what is W transpose X going to be? Neg negative or positive? It's always going to be negative, right? So on this side of the plane, W transpose X is going to be negative because the angle is greater than 90. On this side of the plane, W transpose X is always going to be positive because the angle is less than 90. So in the direction in which W points, you're going to get an inner product that's positive in the direction in which, away from the uh, direction that W points, the inner product is always going to be negative. So basically we want to find a W such that all of the positive class training points are within 90 degrees of the W and all of the negative class training points are more than 90 degrees of the W. Does that make sense? Right, okay. So given this, how do we find such a plane? Turns out it's actually very easy. But then let's look at Rosenblatt's original algorithm. It's an online algorithm which keeps updating your plane as the inputs come in. It's a famous perceptron algorithm. You initialize your W and incrementally update each the W each time you encounter an instance that is incorrectly classified. For this, let me go back to my figure here. So let's say, uh, can I change my color? There's got to be a way of changing my color. I guess not. Okay. So let's say I have a training data instance over here, which is the positive class. Okay. So this is my training data instance. What is the optimal decision boundary for this guy, which gives us the maximum distance from the decision boundary? Can anyone tell me? What would the optimal decision boundary for this instance be? It's going to be this plane, correct? At 90 degrees to it. So what is the optimal W for, the, for, for this X? What's W star for this guy? Anyone? It should be pointing in the same direction as X, right? That's the, that's how you're going to get W transpose X is 90, is, is, is zero, correct? That makes sense? To everybody, right? Just give me a, you know, raise your hand if you got this so I can. Okay, so Eugenia. What is the optimal decision boundary for this instance X, if it's a positive class? If, if I had this decision boundary, then it ends up being very close to it, right? If I had some other decision boundary like this, it's gonna be very close to it. If I want this guy to be as far as possible from the decision boundary, then I want the decision boundary to be at 90 degrees to this vector, right? Hadza, what about you? You get that? Right, yes. And that means 
if the decision boundary is at 90 degrees to x, the weight vector is at 90 degrees to the decision boundary, the weight vector must be along x. Make sense? The equation for the plane that is at 90 degrees to x is simply w transpose a, you know, x transpose whatever is zero, right? It's going to get 90 degrees to x, right? Right, okay. So you want w to be, so w star in this case should be x itself. Now, suppose I have another instance where I have a, so this is an x out here, but it's, oh, let me draw it here, an x out here, but it belongs to the negative class, right? So this is my negative class instance. What is the optimal decision boundary again? Over here. Still at 90 degrees to x, correct? Nothing changed. For the maximum distance, you want the decision boundary to be like so, correct? But what is the optimal weight vector? If it's to the negative class, the optimal weight vector must be exactly opposite to it. You're maximizing the angle, right? We're always looking at linear boundaries at this point because we converted it to a linear problem, right, frame? So, Gyanyang, here is this. So, suppose I have an X of this kind, and then here are all the various decision boundaries I can draw. This is one decision boundary. This is another decision boundary. This is another decision boundary. And so which one puts the x at the farthest distance from the decision boundary? Yun -yun. The last one, right? It has to be at 90 degrees. That's the optimal decision boundary. And so what we have is that for positive instances, that w star equals x. It must point directly at x. For negative instances, you want w star equals minus x. That makes sense? Folks, did this make sense to you? Right. So for the positive instances, w points in the same direction as x. In the negative instance, you want the angle to be maximized, so W must be exactly opposite to X. Right? So this is the simple logic you're going to use. I want to find a W such that W, you know, W transpose X is positive for all red dots and negative for all blue dots. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to cycle through my training instances. And so very simple. I'll go back to my uh, actually, we can just do this with the figures I have. Now, let's say with my current estimate of W, a positive instance is misclassified. Then should I be correcting my W or should I not be correcting my W? If a positive instance is misclassified, I should be correcting it, right? Now, what is the optimal weight vector for the misclassified instance? The misclassified instance is some Xi which has been misclassified, it's the positive class. What is the optimal weight vector for Xi? It's Xi itself, correct? Because it's a positive, it's a positive class. Yes or no? So I just add it to W, right? When X is a positive instance, class instance, and it's misclassified, I pull W towards X by adding X to W. If X is a negative class instance, then, uh, then the optimal weight vector for X is minus X, right? If, it's F, if a ne negative class instance is misclassified, then we know that the optimal weight vector for that instance is minus X, so I pull W towards minus X. Do that make sense? Right. Questions, guys? Okay, I'll wait a second for any questions. Okay, Aditya, if X is a positive class instance, what is the optimal weight vector for that instance? X. So I'm adding plus X to W. 
If X is a negative class instance, what is the optimal weight vector for that X? Minus X. So, so here I have a whole collection of training instances, right? So if I have a whole collection of training instances, here is what is going to happen. Uh, let me just, uh, we can skip the math. I have a collection of training instances that randomly initialize my W. And my random initialized W is going to classify everything on this side as positive, everything on this side as my negative. I cycle through my training instances and I check every one of them if they are correctly classified or not. If they are correctly classified, then I don't have to update the classifier. But then I find that this negative instance is being misclassified as positive. The optimal weight vector for this negative instance is minus of x, which is this blue guy, right? So I'm going to add this blue guy to my current weight vector. That gives me my new weight vector and that gives me my new decision boundary. Then I check all of my training instances again. I find that this positive instance is being misclassified. And so I know that the optimal weight vector for this positive instance is x itself. So I add it to w. And so that's my new weight vector and that's my new decision boundary. And now all the instances are correctly classified. I have a classifier. Does this make sense, the whole process? Right. And this is a very simple uh, perceptron learning rule based on a very simple principle that the optimal weight vector for any single instance either points directly at it or directly away from it. And if the classes can be separated by a hyperplane, this is guaranteed to converge to a solution in a finite number of steps. When the classes are not linearly separable, like something over here, then you cannot find a separating hyperplane. There is none, right? There is always going to be, regardless of how you draw a plane, there will be some positive instances and negative instances on both sides. So the perceptron algorithm will never converge. And that's for just a single classifier with a single perceptron. What about this guy? This is more complex. I want to learn an MLP for this double pentagon region, except I have to learn them from only, from only from those dots, from the red dots and the blue dots. Now I know that it's possible for me to draw, uh, a, to construct a perfectly uh, accurate MLP for this double, double pentagon decision boundary. But then, can I use a corrective learning rule like the perceptron learning rule to learn this classification function? Even if I have the perfect architecture. And it becomes very challenging. Tell you why. Every one of the first level, first layer neurons is learning a linear boundary, right? We compose the entire double pentagon by combining these linear boundaries. And so if I want to learn these guys, these guys, they are learning linear boundaries and the learning rule will only converge if the labels that they are dealt with are linearly separable, right? Whereas on, in reality, the data we provide are not. I mean, what do I mean by this? Let's just assume that I have got given you the correct perceptrons for all of these nine perceptrons and I just have to learn this 10th perceptron so that, you know, in order to be able to compose the entire network for this decision boundary, right? For the double pentagon decision boundary. Now this perceptron, what is the kind of label that we provide? When we provide the data, we are going to give plus one to all the instances inside the yellow region and zero to all the instances outside the yellow region, right? So, or zero or minus one, depending on how we do it. And so this perceptron is going to see this kind of data, correct? Can you actually learn this perceptron? We have to learn that black boundary to get the double pentagon. Can we learn that black boundary from these data for this highlighted per per perceptron? Why not? It's not a trick question. It's not linear, right? So you have blue data on the red side. You can't learn it, right? So what would you need to do to, to be able to learn this boundary? Anyone? 
but you can't use the perceptron learning rule if you allow misclassification. So what can you do? I want to learn this rule. So what do I need to do? Here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to relabel some instances to learn this law because you're restricted to learning linear boundaries. And you can't learn linear boundaries if the data are not linearly separable. That makes sense? Right? And so you have a poll. Keith, if you're not logged in as to Andrew, you may not be able to see the poll. I don't know. Okay, we will show you the once we have 80 responses, so we'll just show you the polls. Yeah, there's a problem with Zoom. From the next class, we'll have this on. Yeah, a, some issue here. Okay, guys, I'm ending the poll. I got five seconds. Okay. So, what is the answer to the first question? For the double pentagon problem, given the data shown on slide 60, and that all but one neuron are already correctly learned, can we use the perceptron rule? No, right? So what problems do you see in learning using the perceptron rule? Perceptron learning will require linearly separable classes to learn the model, but the data are not linearly separable, right? And so this will require relabeling the data to make them linearly separable with the correct decision boundary. So here is what we're going to have to do. We have this data. You obviously cannot learn this perceptron from this data. And if you don't learn this perceptron, then you're not going to get the, the entire network is going to be wrong. So we are going to have to just, just to learn just this one perceptron, not for the rest of them. We're going to have to repaint all of these blue dots as red. And then once we re repaint the uh, blue dots as red, you can learn that one boundary, right? Yes or no? But do we know beforehand which blue dots to paint as red? So how do we go about it? Prachiti, how would you do it? Anyone? Any guesses? So here is what you would need to do. So you have no way of knowing in high dimensional space, Hazem. So you're going to be looking at the overall classification output. And then you're going to try every possible way of relabeling the data. If there are n training instances, there are two ways to n possible ways of relabeling the data. You will have to investigate every one of these and see if you can learn a boundary and see if that boundary results in the perfect overall classification error. There's no other way of doing it. Does that make sense? Yes, no. So here's what we would need to do. I start with this data, Kevin, and then I'm going to try repainting these data with different colors. And so for every repainting, for that repainting, I'll try to learn a boundary. 
If I can learn a boundary using that boundary, I will see what the overall classification error is on the training data. If the overall classification error is not zero, no, or you know, it's not the minimum, then I will try some other way of repainting the data. So I'm going to have to try every possible way of uh, relabeling the data and then verify if the resulting boundary gives me the overall lowest classification error out here. And that's just for one class, one neuron. So here's the problem. When I'm trying to learn this neuron, I must also learn the labels. Each, in, each neuron requires a different labeling scheme, right? And I'm going to have to also learn the labelings for each of these neurons, such that when I learn the boundaries for each of them, the overall network does the perfect job. Does that make sense? So, Hanan, we are not assuming that our initial line is correct. You're relabeling and then estimating the line. So you'd be relabeling the data again and again, estimating a line, and then checking if that line results in the in perfect overall. Yes, Ishan, that's brute force, right? It's not an efficient strategy. It's a useless strategy, right? So for a single line, you have to try out every possible way of relabeling the blue dots such that we can learn a line that keeps all the red dots on one side and then gives you, gives you the perfect decision boundary. And this must be done for each of the perceptrons such that when all of them are combined by higher level perceptrons, we get the desired pattern, basically an exponential search over the space of units, right? And so this means that we need to be figure out how to relabel every instance to get the correct decision boundary. And this must be done for each neuron, getting any one real mislabeling uh, getting any one of these boundaries wrong is going to result in an incorrect overall classifier. So this means that training the network using the perceptron rule is a combinatorial optimization problem. We don't know the outputs of the individual intermediate neurons. So we must also determine the correct output for each neuron for every training instance. This is exponential in time complexity. If you have n inputs, you have to try every way of relabeling them for every one of my neurons. And so it's two raised to n for each one of our neurons. It's not feasible. That makes sense? You're not learning the boundary. You're trying to, uh, you're relabeling. So your final objective is the correct classification at the output, right? So you're, for each neuron, you're going to be finding, a, for every relabeling, you will find a boundary. And so, for, so, you know, if I choose one relabeling for each of these 10, I'd have 10 boundaries, and I'd check if the 10 boundaries combined to give me zero classification error, right? If they didn't, then I'd go back and relabel them all over again, and then have to keep redoing this till I found a, found a relabeling for each of the neurons that gave me perfect or the lowest error in classification. Yes, that's right, Ishan. And this is not gonna be feasible. It's not gonna happen, right? And so perceptron learning rules cannot be used to learn an MLP. You end up with an exponential complexity of assigning intermediate labels. And if the classes are not actually separable, then you know, impossible, right? So people realize that this is a problem. You're not going to be able to use learning rules to learn decision boundaries for complex classification problems. So how do you go about it? Then various greedy algorithms were suggested. Adeline and Madeline, they're on the slides. I'm skipping them. Take a look in the slides. They will turn up in the quiz. But then here's the story, story so we found. Uh, the last two points are the key ones. Nonlinear decision boundaries require networks of perceptrons. And training an MLP with threshold activation function perceptrons will require knowledge of the input-output relation for every training instance, for every perceptron in the network. So this ends up being a combinatorial optimization problem. You cannot learn the network, not using this technique. So the realization that training an entire MLP was a combinatorial optimization problem basically stalled the development of neural networks for well over a decade. 
But then you go back and look at why this error is happening. And the error is happening because our binary error metric of counting, is this classification correct? Or is this classification incorrect? That is not useful. To here, for example, if my current estimate of W gives me this dotted line as my decision boundary, it's making errors on two training instances. So which way should I move the dotted threshold, left or right, to improve the classifier over here? Left, right? But if I move this just a little bit and check the error, if I move it a little bit to the left and check the error, will the error have reduced? If I move it a little bit to the right and check the error, would it have reduced? Also no, right? So a little wiggle, you cannot tell by wiggling a little bit if you're going in the correct direction. So that's a problem, right? That's why it's such so challenging. Or if I have this uh, uh, high-dimensional problem, I have this data. If this is my current estimate for my boundary, the blue line. I can wiggle it all the way to the red line on either side without changing the error. And so if I, I don't know whether moving it left is doing the is improving things or moving it right is improving things, there is no signal, right? And so you can vary the weights a lot without changing the error. So you have no way of knowing if you're changing things in the correct direction. And that's just for that simple perceptron. If I go to a more complex problem like this, the, you have the problem just compounds. The MLP is, I mean, another way of saying that I can change the uh, the the weight without changing the output is like saying that the derivative of the output with respect to the weight is zero, right? And so in an MLP with threshold activations, what we find is that the derivatives with respect to the network parameters are all either zero or infinite when you just cross one training instance, because the moment you cross the instance, the error change, the output changes, the error changes dramatically, right? And so they are basically non-differentiable functions. They are flat. They have zero der derivative nearly er everywhere with respect to the weights. And at the boundaries, there are no derivatives. That makes sense? Right? So, how do we deal with the problem? We're going to change the way of computing the mismatch such that modifying the classifier slightly lets us know if we are going in the right way or not. And this requires changing both our activation functions and the manner in which we evaluate the mismatch between the classifier output and the target output. Earlier, we were just counting errors. What we are going to do now is not count errors. We're going to get a proxy for the count. So first, we are no longer going to use this threshold activation. We are going to, the threshold activation is not differentiable. The derivative is zero everywhere, except at this point where the derivative is infinity. So we will change it to an activation which is smoother, which has no points of this kind. And you have non-zero derivatives over much of the domain. This enables us to estimate parameters using gradient descent techniques. How so? Over here, if my dotted line is my current decision boundary, if I move it all the way to the left over here, it doesn't tell me that the error has gone, that, that I'm going in the right way because moving it left doesn't reduce the error. Instead, if I use a continuous threshold, acti a continuous activation of this kind, and instead of just counting the error, I look at the total distance from the target output to the output of the network. If I use this activation and instead of counting errors, I use as my proxy the total length of these dotted lines. Then if I move this function left from this point to this point, will that error tell me I'm going in the correct direction? Right, if I move it right, will it tell me I'm going in the wrong direction? Right, that's what we are going to do. We are going to do two things. We are going to use a smooth, continuously varying activation 
And for classification, of course, you can just you can compare this output to a threshold of 0.5. And during inference, and you say if it's greater than 0.5, I'll call it class one. If it's less than 0.5, I'll call it class zero, which is fine. But then the function itself becomes smooth. And now the manner in which I quantify the error changes. It looks at the actual distance between the target output and the uh, output of the current output of the network. And so that enables me to figure out how to modify parameters. We have a poll. Can you see the poll? Something up with these Zoom polls. I'll wait five seconds and then we'll just go over the questions. All right, folks, I'm stopping the poll. Most of you can't see it anyway, which is unfortunate. Let's just look at the questions, right? So which of the true <coughs> are following a true of the threshold activation? <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Very sorry. Increasing or decreasing the threshold will not change the overall classification error unless the threshold moves past a misclassified training sample, true or false. We cannot know if a change, increase or decrease, moves it in the correct direction that will result in a net decrease in the classification error, true or false. The derivative of the classification error with respect to the threshold gives us an indication of whether to increase or decrease the threshold, true or false here. The derivative is always zero. It doesn't tell us anything, right? Uh, what about the one below? Uh, if we have a continuous activation, shifting the function left or right will not change the overall classification error unless the crossover point moves past the misclassified training sample. This is a classification error. That still stays true, right? I'm not so... If I'm using the 0.5 value as my classification, this is uh, how I decide my classification. So then I'm saying I'm saying that anything that is above, wherever the function is above this 0.5 line is going to be classed as classified as one. Anything below is going to be classified as zero. If I use it for classification, just counting errors is not going to give me any clue. On the other hand, if shifting the function will change the total distance of the value of the function from this target, is that true or false? The second bullet, that is true, right? Classification error versus total distance, they are not the same. And the derivative of the total distance with respect to the shift of the function gives us an indication of which direction to shift it, true or false. Also true. Now, here's something I want you to remember. This distance, total distance is a proxy to classification error. Will minimizing this proxy always minimize the classification error? Will it all win? Can you give me an instance where it won't? Anybody? So here's what I can have. I can have still have these same points, but let's say I have 1 billion points out here to the right, okay? If I have 1 billion points out here to the right, this line is never actually going to zero, correct? So no, even without an overlap rate, if I have a 1 billion points out here to the right, those billion points are going to try, it. each of them will have a very small distance to the line, but then they're all going to try to decrease the line, distance to the line. So they will keep pushing this curve further and further back, way beyond what is optimal, simply because they're trying to minimize the distance out here. 
that makes sense to you guys. So let's say I have just, I have a lot of points out here, a lot of these guys, a whole bunch of them. I have like tending to infinity, right? Each of them is going to have a very tiny epsilon distance to the curve. So the total contribution to the way I have computed the error, although each of them is infinitesimal, there are so many of them that is going to be significant and they're going to try to decrease this and they're going to push this line back. They may push it in fact all the way out here. That makes sense? Yes or no? Right? So what this means is that minimizing the proxy is not guaranteed to minimize the classification error, right? Yes or no? This is regardless of balancing the sample, right? This The general idea is that the proxy is only a proxy. It's not the actual objective. We are minimizing a proxy because it's the best we can do. Otherwise, we have no way of actually learning stuff, right? So, the, uh, so here are the two things we need. We need continuously varying activation. We want the activation to be differentiable. And we want a continuously varying error function. Meaning, I want to know if I change the input a little bit, the activation function shouldn't be all zero or all one. It should change continuously. We want it to be differentiable. And the error function should be differentiable in that if I move the function, the, my, my network, my curve a little bit, the error function should change. These are the two requirements. So let's see what a continuously varying activation gives us. We're going to no longer use these threshold activations. We're going to use things like these. ReLU, soft plus sigmoid, etc. These activations are differentiable almost everywhere, except maybe at little corners like these. And even here, you can compute what are called subderivatives, which we'll discuss later. So we're going to replace these activations with graded, these threshold activations with graded activation functions. Now, having a graded activation function here means that you can always determine how much a small perturbation of Z is going to change pi. That's what it says, right? You have a derivative. Then you say over here, if I increase my input a little bit, how much does the output change? You can always compute it. That value is not necessary. That, that value is going to be non-zero. So you, are, you now have the ability to find out how perturbations in z change pi. But z is just a weighted sum of x's. So you now also, that means you also have the ability to know how much a small perturbation in w will change z. Chain that with the knowledge of how much a perturbation in z will change y, and you're now able to compute how much a small perturbation of w will change y. That makes sense? Yes or no? Right? Rest of you are very quiet. So z is this affine term here, right? The, the affine function of inputs. So having a graded activation allows you to know, gives you, enables you to know how much changing W changes by. And the most common activation, of course, is the sigmoid activation. One of the most common is the sigmoid activation. It has a nice interpretation. It can be interpreted as the posterior probability of uh, the class one given X. How's that? Uh, this is, you know, in your typical problem, you're not really going to get linearly or separable data. You're going to get blue dots on the red side, red dots on the blue side. And you know, even for the linear problem, you'll never find a hyperplane that clear, clearly separates the two. So if I think of it in terms of a problem with just one dimensional inputs, then for one dimensional inputs, the actual data you're going to see in real life or something like this. The optimal classifier is a threshold, but there is no threshold which clearly separates the red and the blue. So what you can do is to say, instead of just uh, consider, it, you can consider it differently. At each point, you can look at a small window about the point and plot the average value of all the inputs within the point, which is going to be zero here, zero here, zero here. 
as you begin to go into the overlap regions, the average value will increase, and then eventually becomes all ones. And so this average value over here of the training samples within, within that window gives tells you what fraction of training samples at that particular x take y value one. So it's an estimate for the posterior probability of p y equals one given x. And so the sigmoid activation function has this shape. It actually, uh, the class one becomes increasingly probable going left to right, which is typical in many problems and actually models the posterior probability of class one given x. But anyway, it, uh, uh, the, the uh, sigmoid function in any number of dimensions has the same characteristic. It's the smooth curve, which can be viewed as giving you the posterior probability of y equals one given x. We'll revisit that much later in class. Uh, but then for now, moving on, what this means is that if I have a differentiable activation function over here, I'm now able to compute dy over dz. Z is the affine function of inputs, which tells me how much a small perturbation in z perturbs y. And z is a weighted sum of the inputs, an affine function of the inputs. So which means I can compute dz over dw which tells me how much a small perturbation of W changes Z. Chain them up, and I can compute how much a small perturbation of W will change Y. So we can compute changes in the output of the perceptron for small changes in either the weights or even the inputs, right? So chaining them up further, when you look at an entire network, now, because all of these activations are differentiable, I can tell you how much a small change in the z changes this y. Actually, going from up from the bottom, I can change tell you how much a small change in this w changes the output of this neuron. I can tell you how much a small change of this, the output of this neuron changes the outputs of these neurons. I can tell you how much the perturbations of those outputs will change the y. So chaining them all up, I can tell you how much a small perturbation of w will change y. Does increasing w increase y? or does it decrease y? I can tell you that. And so by extension, the, there's nothing special about this particular weight. By making all the activations differentiable, the overall function is differentiable with respect to every parameter in the network. We can compute how a small change in the, any of these parameters changes the output of the network. Exactly how we compute this will uh, Keep it up. We'll hold up for the, for the next class. But does this make sense? What we have here. How having differentiable activations makes the entire network differentiable. So that's one, right? But then there's the second thing. Continuously varying error function is also differentiable. And so going back to our original plot, this error is now simply not going to count the number of misclassifications we will define a divergence function which has specific properties. This divergence function will be zero if the output of the network exactly equals the desired output of the network. At any other, if there's any difference between the two, the divergence will be positive. And finally, the divergence is differentiable with respect to its arguments, namely uh, the output of the network and the desired output. It quantifies the mismatch between the network output and the target function. So we have a new way of looking at the error. We're doing it through divergence functions, which are positive if the two are not exactly the same, which are zero if the two are the same and are differentiable with respect to the output of the network. And now the error that we're trying to minimize is going to be the integral of the divergence itself because that's how we quantify the error. But then we take an extra step. There's no point in my trying to minimize error for x values that will never be seen. For example, in real life, if I'm, if I'm never going to see these extreme values of x, there's no need for me to be minimizing the error in these regions. You just want to focus in those regions of the input that are actually seen. So at each x, we are going to weight the divergence with the probability of actually seeing that x before we take the integral. 
And so this makes sure that you're not wasting any effort on X values that are rare or never seen. And so this integral, what is this integral? It's a divergence between f of x and g of x multiplied by p of x, and it's multiplied. This integral is the expected value of the divergence. Remember that when you take the integral of any function multiplied by its probability, that's just the expected value of that function, right? So this is the expected, or in other words, the average value of the divergence between the output of the network and the desired output of the network over all x's that matter. And this is what we're going to try to minimize. Did this make sense, guys? Yes, no. We have a couple of minutes, one minute. Right? And of course, we don't have g of x, so we're going to sample g of x, obtain input-output pairs as before. And now, a good sampling strategy is actually going to draw the samples of x from the actual probability distribution of x. So you're going to sample them from real life. That way you're not picking x's that are never seen. And rare x's will be rarely picked. Frequent x's will be frequently picked. And that way, when you take the average of the divergences over all of the training samples, in some, this empirical estimate, it's what, what is called the empirical estimate of the expected risk. This is a reasonably good proxy for the average divergence between the uh, output of the network and the desired output of the network. And that's what we're going to minimize. So the overall training problem is this, given a set of training instances of X's and their corresponding desired outputs, we're going to define a divergence function which quantifies the error between the output of the network and the desired output. Then we define an empirical risk, also called a loss, which is the average of these divergences over all training samples. Observe that once X is given, the only thing you can vary is W. So this loss is only a function of W. And then you estimate the network parameters to minimize this empirical risk or the loss. And so again, we're calling it a measure of error, calling it a loss, but it's really a measure of error. The empirical risk, risk loss of W is an approximation to the true risk, which is the expected divergence, which is our actual minimization objective. For a given training set, it's only a function of W. And we're going to minimize this over W. And again, minimizing the loss doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be minimizing this, the, the actual objective. That's just a hope because it's the best we can do. Did any of that make sense? Yeah. And so here's the problem statement. Given training input pairs, output pairs, you're going to define a loss, which is the average divergence over training instances. You're going to minimize it over W. This is a problem of function minimization and instance of optimization. So uh, that's what we're going to cover in the next class, optimization. So just closing out our lesson, we learn networks by fitting them to training instances from a target function. Learning networks of threshold activation perceptrons requires solving a hard combinatorial optimization problem because we cannot compute the influence of small changes to the parameters to the overall error. Instead, uh, we use continuous activation functions with non-zero derivatives to enable a the uh, estimate, uh, which enables us to estimate network parameters. It makes the output of the network differentiable with respect to every network parameter. Now, something that I didn't spend a lot of time over, the logistic activation perceptron actually computes a posteriori probability of the output given the input. We define a differentiable divergence between the output of the network and the desired output for the training instances. And the total loss is the average divergence of all training instances. We optimize network parameters to minimize this error. This is a function an instance of function minimization. Uh, so that's, we'll stop right here.